What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle podcast. I'm Scott Baer, and with me is Ashton Edmonds and Tori McElhaney, and we're coming to you pretty late in the evening on Sunday, October 9th, after a 21-15 to loss to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That was dramatic at, at the finish, shall we say, which fits right in with how the Falcons have played every other game so far this season. But before we can get to the drama of that game, we have to deal with some breaking news. And that is coming in. Uh, the story was broken by NFL Network's Ian Rappaport. The Falcons have traded inside linebacker, longtime Falcons inside linebacker, Deion Jones to the Cleveland Browns for late draft pick compensation. Uh, Tori McElhinney is, is going to dive into the details of all of that. But we do feel like considering that Tori just wrote this story right before we got onto this podcast, that that has to be the first order of business. Uh, so, so Tori kind of, give uh, fans who may not as may not be as up to date as you are um, about the details of this deal and how it can benefit the, uh, the uh, Falcons uh, moving forward. Yeah, this is something that has really been in the works for a while now. I feel like there's been speculation about Deion Jones feature in Atlanta. Gosh, since what, like January, February, since last season ended, I feel like this has been a topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, especially when the Falcons traded away Matt Ryan and then restructured Grady Jarrett and Jake Matthews contracts this off season. It was like, all right, Deion Jones has a whopper of a contract four years, $57 million. That is really eating up a lot of cap space right now. What are they going to do with Dion? That was a question that I feel like we asked every single week over the course of this off season. And it finally got farther and farther along to where you get into training camp and Dion's not out there. They put him on uh, IR with because he had a shoulder procedure um, early in the off season. He comes back, plays a little bit in the final preseason game for the Falcons, and then the Falcons place him on IR before the season starts. Which, when you put someone on IR before the season starts, that's four games you have to miss at minimum. So this was the week if Deion Jones was going to get activated, if he was okay, he could have been activated this week, like how we saw Isaiah Oliver, but that didn't happen. And while all of this is happening, you also have to think about the cap ramifications. The Falcons have one of the largest dead cap hits in the league, like the largest it's massive because you have to take into consideration that Matt Ryan's contract was $40 million that is being taken up in dead money. So you have that. And then you also have a ton of money that's still left over from the Julio Jones trade. You have all of these things. And so it really was kind of coming down to it where it was like, okay, what are the Falcons going to do with Deion Jones? He's on IR. There's still a ton of speculation as to what they were going to do. And finally we have an answer. They have reportedly traded Deion Jones to the Cleveland Browns um, for like Scott, what you're saying, it's been reported that it is a, um, late round draft compensation. So the Browns get Deion Jones and the Falcons seventh round 2024 draft pick. The Falcons relie are relieved of Jones and they get the Browns six round 2024 draft pick. Um, I hope I said all of that accordingly. Um, should free up some cap space. Deion Jones contract had been restructured a little bit. So I believe if this is if the numbers are correct, um, the Browns will pay out his one point three nine million dollar um, salary in twenty twenty two, and that's kind of what they'll take on. But that's kind of the the Cliff Notes version of a story that I feel like we have been talking about nonstop since January and February. Yeah, really for so long, and and you did get all the numbers right. That was pretty impressive because there's a lot of information oh, thank there. You. <laughs> um, and with all the dead money, according to OverTheCap.com, the Falcons are taking on with some IR additions. It's up to about sixty-five million dollars in in dead cap this year. Next year, what's on the books according to OTC is uh, two hundred ninety-three thousand. Okay, so when they add Deion Jones's dead money to next year's cap, that's very livable. Um, that's yeah. nothing that's going to impede them too much. Uh, and if you, if you go back to the NFL scouting combine, Terry Fontenot said that, that he had a bunch of elephants in the room, a bunch of contracts that, that, that he inherited as Tori mentioned, Jake Matthews, Matt Ryan, um, 
uh, Grady Dion Jarrett. Jones, and who am I forgetting about? Grady Jarrett. And 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 Grady Jarrett also, and uh, and he he uh, he tended to all of those um, yes. with this trade, and it does help them move on, um, I, and it does I think put to rest a longstanding story that had been going on forever. I think just if we're just talking about everybody moving on, I think that's good for the Falcons. I think that's good yeah. for Deion Jones. I think who yeah. just kind of wanted to play and wanted a fresh start. Um, and I think for them to get, I, people will look at the draft pick compensation and say, well, that's not very much. That's not the point of this deal. I think Dion was willing to restructure and restructure and found himself at a place where he wanted to play again. I was very clear that it wasn't going to be here. And I think that while it comes kind of in the dead of night on uh, like right <laughs> after week five, at least we have some resolution because there were so much, there, there, there were so many questions about what they were going to do with Deion Jones when he fully got healthy. Um, he hasn't been around too much on the practice field. Um, Tori has got her hand raised and then we'll go to. Ash. Yes. I would, I, I was just going to say like, this shouldn't really come as a surprise to anyone considering what we have seen the Falcons do over the course of this off season. And that includes going out and getting Rashawn Evans. That like, it, it also, you talk about drafting Troy Anderson as high as what they did. And then also, also go back to what Arthur Smith was talking about literally a couple months ago in training camp when he was specifically asked about Deion Jones and he made the comment, he was like, it's not like if Deion's fully healthy, we're going to pull Michael Walker or Rashawn Evans and put Deion Jones in. He will have to, he would have to work for that starting spot back. I mean, these were all topics of conversation that we have talked about ad nauseum. I feel like for the last like five, six, seven months, however long it's been. And now what you're talking about, Scott, finally have a, a resolution that it makes sense. I think it's good for both parties. I agree with that. And also it's just, it's nice to kind of, put a bow on this and, and be able to move on. Yeah, definitely. And, and Ashton, you, you're obviously uh, new to this team and new to this market. So you haven't seen Deion Jones play in person a lot, but, but you have seen Michael Walker play. You have seen Rashawn Evans play and, and Troy Anderson talk about maybe the state of this inside linebacker group. Now that Deion Jones is no longer um, a part of it um, in any way, shape or form. Yeah, for sure. I think Michael Walker, Rashawn Evans, and Troy Anderson have been the glue, I would say, to this de uh, Falcons defense um, through these through these five first games or the first five games. Um, Michael Walker's injury today um, was definitely a, a big hit to the Falcons defense, I would say, especially late in the game, you know, uh, when the Falcons were kind of making a comeback. Um, but I think the state of this linebacker group is, is really good. You know, Rashawn Evans, he has played in the league for a couple of years now. Uh, Michael Walker, he's stepping up to the plate. And I think, um, you know, he's, he's a leader on this defense. And I think more players are looking to him for his leadership and for his play. Um, he's been making plays, you know, all over the field, like I said, through these first five games. And I think Troy Anderson is now getting acclimated to the league. Um, he had a, a really, a, a few nice plays throughout these uh, first five games. And I think today he did really good stepping in for Michael Walker. But um, I think this linebacker core is in a really good spot. Yeah, and they use a second round draft pick on, on Troy Anderson that they have a young guy in Michael Walker and Rashawn Evans has been really good. So I, I, I think they've set themselves up for the future. Just one last note from me on, on this Deion Jones situation is I feel like this was the last order of business for Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith and the Falcons um, to kind of move on from the, from the previous regime, right? All these yep. contracts that they inherited, some veteran players, that had been maybe uh, rewarded beyond what they were, uh, you know, at least some of them that were still getting paid. And I, I think that now that was the final order of business or one of the last to really kind of turn the page. And now Terry and Arthur can move into, especially 2023 without a lot of this dead cap space with a lot of the guys they want to have around. And then, you know, contracts that, that they've, that they've been able to move on from. So I think that that's an important thing. Uh, Tori, Tor, any last words on this? Or are we ready to move on to this Bucks game? I think, I think we have talked about Deion Jones more than anybody has on any podcast. I don't know if I, 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 so I feel like we have hit everything and anything we possibly could about Deion Jones. And, you know, I will say this, he, um, as much as I think the last couple of years, 
especially last year, was not the Deion Jones that Falcons fans knew. I think Deion Jones, his career in Atlanta should be commended. It was a really fantastic career. It's a Pro Bowl career, um, Pro Bowl season. I mean, this is a guy who helped Atlanta win games. And so you talk about fresh starts. I feel like it's kind of the same sentiment as when they traded away Matt Ryan and traded away Julio Jones. And it's like you don't forget what they did for the Falcons and you kind of hope the best for them as they, as they move on, because everybody right now is kind of getting to the point where it's like, okay, everybody's turning a page on, on what was and now what Terry and Arthur want to do in Atlanta now. Yeah. I mean, nothing in this or very rarely in this league does it end perfectly clean, but I do think that time and separation will eventually allow fans to be able to acknowledge all of the contributors to what was a very good run um, for over, over a, a couple seasons in Atlanta. Um, yeah. now moving on to this game, somehow Ooh. after everything that <laughs> happened in this game, uh, yeah. now it plays second fiddle to what we just discussed. Uh, but nonetheless, a 21 to 15 loss to the, to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. This is another one of the situations like we've seen with the Falcons every time is that there, there's a dramatic finish. It comes down to, to the fourth quarter of a game. That's ultimately only separated by one score. And yeah. Um, there was a point where the Falcons were down 21 points and then they came roaring back uh, with shadows of, of week two against the Rams and they couldn't finish the job then they couldn't finish the job here, but let's get right to what everybody wants to hear about yeah. here is that the Falcons were, did not have an opportunity to complete their comeback because after Grady Jarrett sacked Tom Brady on third down uh, with, uh, I don't have the time in front three. of me, but three minutes left. Um, Grady Jarrett was flagged and penalized for a roughing the passer penalty that extended the Buccaneers drive. The Buccaneers drive ultimately continued downfield um, to the point that they were able to let the clock expire. The comeback never happened. And the call was extremely controversial, both when watching it live and afterward with what was said. Um, yeah. Not by the Falcons, okay? Uh, Grady Jarrett uh, declined to comment right after the game. Arthur Smith stayed away from making any overt criticisms. Uh, Tom Brady said, I don't throw the flags, I think. <laughs> and, yep. um, and, and, and let's get to the most important one here. And I'll just read it, guys, if you don't mind. Um, this is from... PFWA pool reporter Greg Allman, who covers the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, um, in an interview with referee Jerome Boger. The question was about uh, Grady Jarrett's roughing the passer penalty that extended the drive, and the reporter asked for clarification on what constituted roughing the passer on that play. Jerome Boger said, and I quote, what I had was the defender grabbed the quarterback while he was still in the pocket and unnecessarily throwing him to the ground. Think about that phrase. This is what I was making my decision based upon. He was then asked uh, because the play was similar to an injury to Miami quarterback to a Tago, Tago, Tago Vailoa. Tago Vailoa. Tago Vailoa. <laughs> um, was it something that you had made a specific measure to try to watch out for takedowns on the quarterback like that? And the referee said, no, not necessarily. Um, his comment seemed to pour gasoline on a fire that extended not just throughout the Falcons fan base, which was obviously upset by it, but also across the NFL landscape. This is going to be a conversation on good morning football on ESPN sports center and all over the place. This, uh, th uh, this was a major controversial call. I'm now editorializing for one second. If I may, I think the flag was incorrect. I think it cost the Falcons dearly as Tori put it in her, uh, excellent recap of the situation. We have absolutely no idea if it would have set up it, or if the Falcons could have completed a comeback and beat the Buccaneers. They were down only six, a touchdown and an extra point would have won it. We don't know what, what would have happened there, but if we're talking about that call specifically. Uh, I don't agree with the call that was made. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to go back and, and watch it because watching it live, you, you kind of, I mean, there's the emotion of the game and everything like that. And the Falcons are, are roaring back and everything. But then to go back and watch the replay, it's really hard to watch the replay. And I think 
every feeling that not only Falcons fans feel, but I think the like people who are watching this play within the league at large, every feeling of kind of anger, frustration, I think is very valid um, because it, I mean, I, I, if just myself, I don't agree with the call at all. There's not a part of me that agrees with it, but it's the call that was made. However, I also think that it, it goes to show you um, when we were watching the game live, and I don't think people saw this because we were in a TV timeout because it was at the two minute mark and Grady Jarrett, I have never seen Grady Jarrett as agitated and fr visibly frustrated as what he was. He was pacing the field, absolutely pacing up and down. I don't think I saw him stop moving from the moment that flag was thrown until the end of the game. And, and it, it is really tough when you're talking about a player like Grady Jarrett, who in that moment, we're talking about a guy who for the last three weeks has come up with a sack when it mattered most. And for that to happen on a let's be honest, kind of a technicality of the rule. And it's a very like judge, a, a, a very much like how you interpret the rule in the moment. Like that is very, very frustrating. And I honestly, I, I, I was kind of hoping when we went into the locker room post game and we go into this um, post game press conference with Arthur Smith, I'm sitting there thinking like, oh, they're about to just like go in like they're about to go off on these guys like blah blah blah. I think it's very much in the same mindset I think as what a lot of people thought um because it did feel kind of like that that you know it's like screw the fines who cares like that's I think the sentiment that a lot of people were thinking but that didn't happen at all what happened was is Arthur Smith comes out and he's very much like very adamant about not talking about it and like not really answering questions about it. He answers the questions, but it's essentially like, I haven't seen the film and I need to go back and watch it because I need to know how I need to coach that situation. It was very, very like buttoned up. And then Grady Jarrett declining to do a post game interview, which is not something that Grady Jarrett like ever does. I think that should go to show you how much he really cared about that moment. Um, I personally don't think I could have gotten in front of a camera and been able to say something and not have gotten in major trouble. And I think Arthur Smith, you know, we'll talk to him on Monday and I'm sure it'll come up again. But something that I want people to understand is like, yes, like you can kind of get like, wh like, why didn't Arthur Smith like stick up for his guy? It's like, well, you don't know if you're going to see this officiating crew again. And if you burn that officiating crew, like, and the reputation that you could have like with officials at large, like that's a, a part of the conversation too. It's not just about the money and getting fined or whatever. It's about all of this stuff combined. And so it's a really tough situation, I think, for Grady Jarrett and Arthur Smith to be in to where they can't say like, we don't freaking agree with this because there's no way that they freaking agree with it because it was ridiculous. But that's just me. <laughs> like just uh -huh. just going on a spiel again but for real it was very it was a very very frustrating moment and again i think every emotion anger frustration is valid in those moments uh ashton uh, what were they saying on the broadcast after it happened and what was your uh reaction to it yeah i mean watching it live it, it looked like a regular grady jarrett sack you know from the last three games if i'm being honest um the people, the announcers on the broadcast, um, you know, I think they were trying to figure out what exactly was going on on the field um, because they kept replaying it. They kept replaying it. And um, once the official call came that it was a, a roughing the passer, um, even the announcers didn't know exactly what was going on until they made the official call. Um, just because, you know, it compared to, I guess, Tua's hit and compared to Grady Jarrett's second Tom Brady, it was... It was it was different all you know throughout it was different all the way so um you know i think everybody was confused at the call um and you know arthur smith looking at Arth looking at arthur smith watching it live you know he was even like holding his face like i you know i can't believe this um but watching it live it it looked like a regular sack um and i was i was confused i could not agree with you all more about you know i think the call was wrong but you, like tori said you can't really burn these bridges with the this officiating crew because you, you might see them later on down in the season so um just gotta I also, what the refs were saying 
Yeah, and I also think um, something that, Scott, you were talking to Caleb Huntley about in the locker room that I put in the story that I thought was really, like, well said. It was, he was like, you know, it looked like just another sack. And he was like, and he was talking about that moment and how in that moment, the offense felt as confident as it had all game. Like, that's a, that's a part of this, too, is like, the repercussions, like I know, like what I wrote, I was like, you know, we don't know if like, let's say the call doesn't happen, the Bucks punt the ball, the Falcons get the ball back, like with two minutes and 45 seconds left, like whatever it is, who's to say they don't go three and out, you know, like who's to say that doesn't happen, but talking to Caleb Huntley in the locker room and he makes the comment, he was like, you know, like we felt like the momentum had shifted essentially to us we were able to move the ball you got oz in in the end zone you got avery in the end zone it was a one score game it felt different at that point and so i i think he even said i can't remember his exact quote but it was something along the lines of like we felt good like getting the ball back or or something scott do you remember what the quote was um i don't actually (laughs) <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. I, but it was just something along the lines of like, we believe that if we would have gotten the ball oh, back, like we yeah. could have gotten the job done, I think is kind of the yes. gist of it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and I think that that's, we're like, we're never going to know if that's accurate, but uh, nonetheless, it, it, this is another one of these games that came down to the wire. It did have a, a controversial moment. And the weird thing is Grady Jarrett will speak to the media again. And he'll have yeah. some comments on it one way or the other. And Arthur Smith will talk about it on Monday and maybe NFL officiating through their Twitter account or through a statement or something like that will, will address this call at some point. Nothing is going to make you feel better about it because it's <laughs> not going to go back and change what happens. Right. You know, um, it's, it's just not. Arthur, as you pointed out, Tori, Arthur Smith getting upset in front of a mic uh, of, a, of a microphone is not going to change the play. The NFL admitting it was wrong, it doesn't do it like the NBA does, but that's not going to change the play. It's not going to change the outcome. The Falcons are still two and three, and I and I transitioned here kind of to our last overarching topic about something that I wrote about and something that Ashton wrote about that I think is an important part of of this, right? Is that I thought, okay, well, here's another example to write something or a column about how the Falcons are fighters, how they never give up, how they're so close to to kind of completing some of these improbable victories. And then in talking to Jake Matthews, he said, yeah, that's great, but we already knew we could fight, but what was unacceptable, and I think this is them leveling up it's not like, oh, we, 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 we really tried hard. This is, yeah. we got to do better earlier so we don't have these problems late. And I, mm-hmm. I think that that was an important thing Ashton wrote about with Marcus Mariota talking about having to turn things on early. Um, the reason why I didn't know about the end of the Huntley quote, Tori, is because I was desperately searching another story to find a quote by Lorenzo <laughs> Carter, um, um, who I thought was uh, was like pretty good on this topic as well, you know, and, 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 and that's why I look at it, which Casey is Hayward really, was too. Yeah. And, and I think that, I, I think it's good that these guys realize it's not like, Oh, we came up just short. It's actually, you know, something more than that. Lorenzo Carter said, we definitely have to clean it up and make more plays early in the game that might keep us from having to fight for our lives at the end. And that's, what's happening right? Is yep. They were down 21 and they need nothing short of a football miracle, right? <laughs> they're down 28, they're down 25 points to the Rams and they need something crazy to happen to try to get back into it. Well, if you didn't fall back that far, you wouldn't have to climb so far to get back out of the hole that you dug, yep. right? So I think that that's an important thing moving forward. I'll just talk about the uh, defense, right? We um, And then Ashton, you can talk about it from the offensive side. Defensively, we've seen that their strongest play has come in the fourth quarter over final drives. I thought they did a really good job containing the run of the Bucks, but Tom Brady's quick passing game was an absolute killer. Too often they were getting the Tampa Bay in third downs, but they were third and manageable or, or third and short. And they were being converted. They were uh, they were executing so many plays. And I think that 
uh, eventually that that does wear on you. Eventually they did give up some touchdowns and it was just too much before they kind of kicked it in gear and shut things down um, in the fourth quarter. So ultimately I agree with Lorenzo. I, I agree with Jake and I agree with what Ashton is going to tell you about what Marcus said in that you can't start that flat against a quality team and expect to come out with a victory. We said before, we're not writing the Falcons off of any game anymore. They have shown us reason that they can, that they can compete with anybody, but that means competing all the time. It doesn't mean only competing in the third and the fourth quarter. It means kicking it in earlier. Uh, that didn't happen defensively. Ashton, what did you think of their offensive performance? Yeah. I mean, so in the first, the two first quarters alone, the Falcons had 89 total net yards compared to Tampa Bay's 297 net yards. Um, but Marcus Mariota hit it right on the head. They have to be better on first and second downs. They just weren't executing on first and second downs, which were pretty, which were, you know, that cost them a lot. Also the costly penalties that the offensive line, the, the holding, um, just all of those different things combined, um, just I would say knocked off the momentum of the offense. And I think, um, you know, that knocked off the, and also you factor in Kyle Pitts and Cordell Patterson not being in. So you now have to rely on Caleb Huntley, Tyler, Tyler Algier, um, Drake London, young players to step up and carry a heavy load. Um, and I think, you know, they were just trying to figure it out as the game went on, but it was just so many, I think the Falcons were kind of messing up themselves going into the, or throughout the course of this game. And um, I think that's why the offense struggled throughout the first three quarters, to be honest. Yeah, Tori, what do you weigh into this whole thing as they try to apply kind of what they have learned from this game? I mean, early on, it seemed like it was going to be lopsided in every phase. And then all of a sudden it wasn't in a hurry. Yeah, I, I mean, I think going off of the the offensive performance, I through the first half was not really like upset by what we were seeing from the defense. Like, yes, they were giving up yards, but we have said time and time again, if I said it once, I said it a thousand times already, like this defense operates in a bend don't break type of mentality. As long as they're not score, if the, as long as the Buccaneers are not getting in the end zone, you're all right. For me, it really hinged upon what Ashton was talking about on first and second down and how the Falcons were consistently not able to get in a third and short situation. I mean, I, I'm going to have to go back and, and look at it and see how many third and long situations they were in, especially in that first half, because when the Falcons are in a third and long situation, they get away from who they are, which we know is a physical run first team. That's who they want to be. That's who Arthur Smith wants them to be. And when you are in a third and 12, third and 10, third and nine, you can't be that in that moment. And so I think for me, it's like that whole, that's something that's going to be um, a shameless plug. Like my notebook's going to be a lot about like the offensive operation when they get maybe three or four yards off of a run on first down in comparison to when they don't, when they have an incompletion on first down. So these are all very like minute topics that we're talking about, but in the grand scheme, when you aren't converting at a clip on first and second down, and you're consistently putting yourself behind the sticks on third down, it makes it a lot harder for this offense to operate the way that it wants to. So that's my spiel. That's my two takes on it. <laughs> yeah. And, and as we kind of wrap this thing up, but I think that the, the roughing the passer call will dominate headlines and discussion yep. on radio and podcasts and television shows and all that type of thing for a while. But I think the latter part of this podcast, the more, the less um, grabby topics Yes. Or what the Falcons really have to continue to work on and progress and improve at as they move through a difficult stretch where they face um, the San Francisco 49ers next week. They suffer, the 49ers suffered a lot of injuries. They're starting safety, they're starting cornerback, their mm -hmm. kicker, and Nick Bosa all went down with injuries against Carolina. They're going to lick their wounds in West Virginia before coming down to Atlanta. That's going to be a big game. And the uh, Cincinnati Bengals as well. This is a very difficult three game stretch and they, and they need to apply lessons that they learned against Tampa Bay. If they hope to go out there and beat the 49ers, beat the Bengals, get back above 500 and really assert themselves as a team 
to be respected no matter who they're playing. So uh, I think that's going to, wow, we went through a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> so much. <laughs> I, uh, I think that's going to wrap it all up for um, Tori, Ashton, and me. Uh, please rate, review, subscribe. Uh, just another reminder, if you're a Falcons Final Whistle subscriber, please go over to the Falcons Podcast Network. Subscribe there. You can get all of our podcasts there in addition to Falcons in Focus and Falcons Audible. I cannot wait to hear Dave Archer and Derek Rackley and DJ Shockley talk about this Grady Jarrett thing. Also, one last thing, big kudos to Dave Archer, right? West yeah, Archer, yes. oh, I'm sorry. Uh, West Durham. Uh, West Durham. Got, had some flight issues. Dave Archer yeah. called this game by himself, by himself, unreal. a football game by himself. That's unreal. Very <laughs> difficult. Uh, the man really worked his way through it. Analysis and play by play, all of it without a whole, a whole lot of notice that he was going to have to do that. Uh, big ups to uh, Dave Archer. So anyway, thank you guys so much for joining in, for subscribing, for listening, for giving us that five-star review. And we will talk to you after next week's game against the 49ers.